Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros, welcome back to the Yo Elliot Show. Today I got two guests and we're going to roll with some really amazing conversation here as always. So I'd like to introduce Patrick Coffin and Ryan Moreau. Uh, Both of these gentlemen are working together on a project that they were so uh, gracious to ask me to be a part of called Hope is Fuel. We'll dive into that for a moment, uh, in a moment, but uh, I'd like to introduce Patrick as uh, somebody I've seen on YouTube many times, talking about some really cool Catholic stuff, and he's also, also the author of a book called uh, The Contraception Deception. I love that. I think we should dive into that a little bit here soon. The Patrick Coffin Show, uh, Catholic Answers, where I think I saw him first, as well as, um, what else, author, speaker, just all around dope dude. Welcome, Patrick. Recovering Canadian. Recovering Canadian. Okay. Yeah, that's fair yeah. enough. Uh, <laughs> did you sneak across the border? Because you know how... Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Strictly, strictly followed all the rules. No, I became a U.S. citizen about two years ago. Uh, so technically I'm dual, but I was uh, born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the East Coast. So go to Maine and make a right. That's where okay. I was uh, born Yeah, and well, congratulations. There was a time when Thank all you. the liberals were flying north. So I guess you decided to come south as a result. <laughs> story of my life i'm the salmon who's uh flopping upstream against the groovy spirit of the times yeah <laughs> it's like a form of the balkan balkanization that we're beginning to see or we've been seeing for a while mm-hmm. and uh ryan is a serial serial entrepreneur uh and mega church yeah. speaker uh as well as <laughs> as well as partners with patrick on hope is fuel ryan Thanks for joining us, brother. Thanks, Elliot. Man, I'm glad to be here. F- former mega church speaker, Catholic revert, about six years ago, and uh, yeah. so yeah, mega church speaker. You would, you you would think more in terms of a Protestant because they're great at getting on stage and blasting Jesus sure. all over the place. Uh, how do you how do you um, bring that flavor to the Catholic faith? Because I think well, it's needed. Well, it is. I mean, it's certainly needed. I should also say, uh, Patrick, being a recovering Canadian, I'm a recovering Californian. Uh, so up here in, in North Idaho now, um, you know, man, I, getting on the stage actually is not happening as much as it used to. It's certainly needed. And I'm seeing a lot of folks, you know, we don't see enough just how many Protestant pastors right now are becoming Catholic. And it really comes down to the sacraments, something that I can't offer, something that we, we recognize as uh, being a gift, an apostolic gift. And um, once you come to realize and recognize uh, the need and the graces that come with the sacraments. Uh, I had to step back off the stage, so to speak, and and recognize my role. And um, as far as getting in front of people, I think that that's what we're doing with Hope is Fuel right now and using uh, some of that experience myself. And of course, most people know Patrick from his days at Catholic Answers and what he's doing with Coffin Nation. And uh, so we're, we're right in the wheelhouse being able to talk to people, that's for sure, and talk to them about Christ, talk to them about Jesus and uh, introduce them to to the fullness of the faith and the fullness of truth and ultimately to the hope that comes from it. Amazing. So how did you go from uh, mega church speaker to Catholic? 
You yeah. mentioned the sacraments, and I just have to interject real quick that the sacraments will humble the most proud of us. And so I see that happening as well. You know, go plant churches, go speak to a million people, or get on your knees, stick out your tongue, and receive our, our Lord into your body. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. You say, how did I get there? You know, prayer, uh, prayer of other people. Um, of course, my own free will and, and answering that call and having the eyes to see and ears to hear. The quick version of it is um, at about 11 or 12, I had I actually was baptized Catholic, had my first communion, um, never, um, I should just say got wrapped up in the world a little bit and, and you know, uh, got love for, for, there's one body of Christ and I got love for the Protestant brothers and sisters. But, um, you know, jumping into that world, it, it doesn't ask a lot of you. Uh, you know, it, it really doesn't, other than to maybe get on your knees and say a prayer, which is great because we all want to be close to God. But um, during that time, I had a very close friend whose mom, of course, her name was Mary. And uh, and she would say to me every time I'd see her, Ryan, you will come back. You will come back. I pray for you every day. And John 6 will bring you back. And of course, uh, to not get long winded in this, many years, actually 10 years of study, even while I was speaking in many of these places. And at the time I was writing, I had a blog, which I had since deleted. There, there was just a few things that had been going on. But in that process, um, John 6 came calling and I couldn't escape. The word, if I was going to claim to, to follow what scripture has to say, I couldn't escape the fact that that life is found in the body of Christ and in, in his blood and what it means to our salvation. And so um, wild enough, it's a, it's a much longer conversion story or reversion story. But um, I called up Mary one day and said, hey, it's been 10 years. I thank you for praying for me. Um, I'm coming back into the fullness of the faith. I recognize what Christ gave us in the sacraments and in the church that that he founded and, and put in the hands of Peter. And she says, oh, honey, oh, honey. I said, what is it? I thought you'd be a little more excited. And she said, well, my doctor called me 30 minutes ago and said, I have three months to live. This is God's way of telling me my work is done here. And uh, ever since that time, I've, I've just tried to take that torch or that baton, we'll say, and and run with it um, and sharing and sharing the the story of the gospel, but in the fullness of it, in the way that, that you know, only the Catholic Church really has, as it was handed, like I said, to into the hands. The keys were given to Peter. And um, it's still rolling in spite of all the ugliness we see right now. It's amazing how those baptismal graces kick in at some point. It's like a ticking time bomb in us. So many uh, fallen away Catholics that I know, uh, I find out they were baptized and I just say, oh, OK, if you're really a seeker, it's just a matter of time. Elliot, let me tell you, man, I had this. This just happened with a close friend of Patrick and mine. Um, he actually was was uh, he had been baptized, uh, born in Chile, where everybody's baptized in, in Chile, as you can imagine. And, right. um, you know, I will tell you, man, it's the power of the rosary. It was something I've mocked for years when I was on those other stages and yeah. spent five years praying for him and his family. And they all came in at the Easter vigil, never pushed on it, just let it left it in the hands of our blessed mother, lived our life, uh, let, let, uh, you know, lead a good, clean life already. They had that to see. And um, it's those baptismal graces you spoke of. And I know that's that's your story as well, being baptized and coming back and flirting with all kinds of other things out there. But but in the end, all, all we have out there is the absolute truth, the objective truth. And um, and that ultimately, too, is, is what gives us hope. Right. So it's uh, it's one of those things you can't escape it. There is no there is nothing past the Catholic faith that that is that is the end when it comes to uh, joining yourself to the body of Christ. Yeah, if you're honest in your seeking and uh, especially history. Patrick, dude, thank you so much. I was so honored when you reached out to me on Twitter and invited me to be a part of your new project. It sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. Our interview was awesome. So if anybody gets an opportunity to join your project, they'll see that. Uh, anybody here who's watching my YouTube channel. Uh, tell us a little bit about what Hope is Fuel is all about, uh, how you guys decided to come up with it and what the vision is here. Sure. Well, in 2014, my good friend and partner that I've been once again enjoying hearing, I've heard that story before. There's always a different finesse every time I hear his return story, which is great. Um, he acquired the URL hopeisfuel.com, which is our standalone. That's our kind of our main forum wheelhouse home base. Um, hopeisfuel.com slash events if you want to find out about this upcoming um, event. You call it a project. It is a project. We, we've kind of cobbled together different ways of describing what it is. It's a course, it's a Congress, it's a summit, it's a, it's a, I suppose, conference, but really it's a course. Looks like we're gonna close in on 50 speakers 
with 45 minute targeted interviews on everything to do with intentional discipleship. It's not apologetics. We don't get into the nitty gritty of where purgatory is in the Bible or uh, defending Marian dogma right. necessarily, but it's more the, the every, everyday questions that, that Catholics have who want to take their faith to the next level, whether it's how do we get from the crazy 60s to transgenderism? Uh, what are the best practices for keeping your kids in the faith? How do you stay grounded when we've got uh, upside down Vatican and upside down Washington? We're kind of living in this strange clown world none of us have really seen before. So it's easy to go from blue pill, red pill, and then and then what I call the black pill, or um, really it's the temptation to despair. Like the world sucks <laughs> and people lose hope if they stop at the black pill. But that's not the end of the story. There's also the gold pill, which is the sacramental graces and the fact that God is always at work and there's always enough grace. You don't get pummeled with it. You don't get flooded with a tsunami of it, but you do get enough. So all of our speakers, starting with you, Elliot, were, were handpicked because of their ability to wake people up to the things that are hiding in plain sight. I love the image of, of baptism for those who kind of drifted away from the faith. It's like in late August, someone points out that there's a massive Christmas gift still under the tree you never opened. <laughs> Right. right. It was given. Yeah. But you have to open it and receive it. So that's that, exactly that's been my experience. Answer. I thought I, you know, I turned away from the faith or really wasn't very catechized into it. But when I discovered it, mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, this is a treasure trove. It goes deep. It goes wide. It's so expansive and amazing. So you're right. It's a it's a gift. And it's a shame that more uh, baptized Catholics who have fallen away and either become uh, Protestant or worse, atheist or just purely secular, um, have mm -hmm. misconceptions about the faith because they just didn't learn. And I think what you guys are doing is showing how practical, applicable, but even more so how timely the truths of the faith are. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors is uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen, the Archbishop of New York, who died in 1979. He won an Emmy Award for his TV show, just an incredible <laughs> writer and yeah. holy Catholic bishop. Uh, Bishop Sheen said, he who would marry the spirit of an age quickly becomes a widower. Mm. So the, the truths that Christ give us are not just for first century Palestine. They're for every country, every time, every context. This is what the word Catholic means, right? It means Holocaust means of the whole or universal. So the truth that is Jesus Christ is not time bound. It's applicable to everybody who has a human mother, as, as he did. So we're, we're just trying to apply the timelessness of the faith to people's everyday experience, whether it's how to answer woke ideology. What is exorcism? What is deliverance prayer? What, are the, what, are the, what's, what have been the demon seeds in the world that have led to the rise of, of more and more trained priests as exorcists? Uh, how do you recover from divorce? Or more hopefully, if your marriage is broken and hurting, how can you fix it? So those are the those are the issues that we think provide the most this sense of helplessness or hopelessness. And hope is a universal concept. Elliot, I know you talk to a lot of people. Ryan and I have had this conversation more than once. This is a left, right, progressive, uh, conservative, traditionalist. This hopelessness or the sense of uh, fear, like what's the cabal have next for us? Is there going to be another pandemic? Are they going to impose the, the satanic diaper face mask again? Are we, are we going to get a new injection 201? Uh, you know, Russian balloons, spy, <laughs> everything is, is fear porn. And we just say enough is enough. We want to provide the, that golden pill of hope right. in a practical way. And Christ gives us th that advice, right? He says, be in the world, but not of this world. Um, I don't know, remember exactly mm -hmm. where he says that or if I'm misquoting it. But there's this tendency to be overly uh, occupied with what's happening around us, uh, the, the happenings in the news and in the world, and not realize that, look, this is all God's plan regardless. And so as long as we can return to the truths, return to the sacraments, and return to God, uh, we can, I don't want to say reverse things, but we can come back home. Ryan, you guys mm -hmm. did 50 interviews so far. Yeah, we're, huh? we're, right? we're, we're closing in on 50 right now. When we set out to do this, I think, Patrick, we decided we were going to go for 30, which, you know, was about the, was the age. Oh, yeah, that's right. Let's, let's, let's go, go for 30. This 30. is the age, you know, Jesus is ministry. We, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all kinds of, you know, mathematical somersaults in our head to try and figure this out and make this cute from a marketing standpoint. But, you know, it's re getting close to 50 because we're recognizing that some of the areas that people are experiencing hopelessness 
are very micro, right? People dealing with anxiety and depression and things of this nature, like Dr. Ray Grandy talking about right. that. And other people, like Patrick said, that are concerned about what the cabal's got going next, or how do we deal with this tranny stuff that's going on all around us, or why are men acting like women and women acting like men? And not only that, but the foundation of why that's wrong. See, like part of the issue, you know, Patrick and I were talking about this this morning. Part of the real issue that we see and that uh, that the Catholic Church does bring is a basis, a, a, a home base, a foundation for what's true. And it's not true if you're born a, born a male to be a female. People know that. So the majority of folks look at this and they say to themselves, my gosh, like, where's the world going, right? You'll help famous boomer line, my parents included. It's going to hell in a handbasket, you hear people say. That's really a hopeless, hopeless right. statement. And the reality is, is right. we do have hope. We have eternal hope. We have temporal hope. To your point, Elliot, about that passage of scripture you're referring to, um, in the world, but not of it, being in the world and, and not of it. You know, Hope's Fuel in general is a movement. It's not just a single event. This is our signature Catholic course because we recognize that this is the baseline that people can look at and lear- learn from and listen to and really understand the why behind the what of all that's going on. And they can find it in one place. Okay. But we view ourselves also as Catholic in philosophy, but secular in appeal. There are plenty of folks out there who, you know, yes, Protestant, yes, atheist, yes, agnostic, yes, Buddhist. There are themes and threads. I mean, people forget, and don't quote me on this exact percentage, but it's like a banana is 50% the same DNA as a human being. There are themes and threads in the way that God created the world, you know, that we can we can find common denominators. In concentric circles, there is middle ground. And what we want to find is those areas of truth, not only that we can have a conversation about, but that we can speak to that truth with some kind of certainty, some kind of power, right? Because we know it's true because the church, yes, has told us it's true. Yes, the Holy Spirit has told us it's true. And that we can come and, and really have a place that when people go, oh, no, it's go- everything's going to hell in a handbasket. We go, no, 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 no. No, it's actually not. And, and your anxiety is not the end of you and, and your death is not the end of you and your child choosing to choosing to live this way is not the end of you. There are reasons for these things. Some of them, again, macro and some of them micro. And that's why we're now getting close, going back to the original question of 50 speakers, because we're doing everything we can to plug our fingers in those dikes. You know, of where, where that water's coming out, we want to make sure we touch it. And what's beautiful is that people are finding out what we're doing, even on short notice. You know, there are other things Patrick and I are working on with Hope is Fuel. This is just far too important for such a time as this. And as people find out what we're doing, we're getting calls from people like, uh, well, this wasn't a call. This is somebody Patrick talked to, but Gavin Ashenden, for example, the, the, um, the former chaplain to the Queen of England. We're having a conversation with him just yesterday as we were recording what he's going to discuss, his conversion in 2019 to the Catholic faith and why. And recognizing that there is that that final bumper is the Catholic faith because it has the answers. It has what people are looking for. And when that happens and other folks find out, I was with four priests last night having cigars. And these guys, I shouldn't be telling you that, but, and these dudes, it's unbelievable. They're getting so excited about this because they go, you know what? You guys have a different voice. When people see our caller, they don't always want to listen to us. There are other people who will only listen to a caller, which is why we have priests like, Father Dwight Longenecker, who's also a convert. Why we have Father Alexander Crow, who's a, a, a up and coming, well known exorcist. Who uh, you know, I know you're close with Tim Gordon, who just spoke with Tim a couple Fridays ago. Uh, we have Father Robert Spitzer, who, beyond being the former president of, of Gonzaga and uh, University and being a um, having the Magus Institute, is a physicist by trade. I mean, we're talking about evil, and we're talking about it at the deepest levels. And so it's really exciting, and and these 50 speakers plus or minus it may end up at 45 people are human they may drop off before the recording hits and we'll find a way to get them onto our future podcasts and things but it's exciting elliot because we recognize that there is that hopelessness as patrick mentioned and we are going to find ways to bring hope to it with the truths of christ not just our own wisdom unless it's coming from the holy spirit amazing yeah and with the confusion it's beautiful that we have an answer it's 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 only confusing when we step away from the truth uh, Patrick, you're, I assume you're the one who has been facilitating all the conversations, right? You and I spoke earlier this week, so mm-hmm. you're doing a lot of talking with a lot of amazing people. Uh, what was uh, your most, say, um, surprising conversation 
Oh boy, that's kind of asking me like uh, which of my of uh, which of my kids do I love the most? Surprising. Wow. Um Or just a few surprising things or Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh I would say that um Father Alexander Crow had a memorable conversation. I mean, that this this is a this is a young priest. He's only been ordained 2 years, Monday through Friday all the time his ministry is is taken up with with uh deliverance ministry and and imposing i'll say imposing because it's not a fair fight imposing the right of exorcism on people who are possessed which is the more rare of the levels of demonic infestation or activity but uh just the 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 fact that the demons above all are legalistic and they know whose authority uh is is able to to vanquish them and the patience uh, that it takes to really liberate someone from from a diabolical influence. You know, if all you do is watch Hollywood movies like The Exorcist, which is a great movie in its own right, but it's got some misleading qualities, like you're one and done. No, this is a long this is a long journey. And all of the all the New Age stuff, yoga, um, uh, Wicca, Reiki, all the whole all the tentacles of the New Age movement that have fed and watered this. Um, the situation uh, uh, where, whereby more and more exorcists are needed. Um, I think uh, Dr. Ray Grandy was talking about how to think like Jesus. It was a really interesting conversation. He's got 10 adopted kids. He's a clinical psychologist. How to deal with anxiety by putting on the mind of Christ. Because so much of anxiety depression is about two things. Bad thinking about your circumstances, which you can't change. Sometimes you cannot change your circumstances. What you can change is your attitude toward them. Right. You know, I remember reading this. My mom told me this as a kid. Um, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right. Yeah. So when you say, yeah, so so mindset. And the second thing is that depression and anxiety are usually the the manifestation of the loss of hope. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your religion or your, your politics. If you've lost hope, brother, you're going to have a battle with depression. And so the antidote is simply to point the way. Hey, there's hope. The way, the truth, and life. It's not a program. It's not a book. It's not a DVD. It's not even a course. It's a person. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the manifestation of God's love. And uh, Ryan and I have this joke, you know, God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's the good news. So uh, in catechesis with my children, which every Tuesday and Thursday we gather around for homeschool, right now we're doing virtue. Mm -hmm. And so we're mm -hmm. learning about the th three theological mm -hmm. virtues and then the natural virtues. Uh, hope happens to be one of these three theological virtues, uh, faith, hope, and charity. Um, I don't think most people understand what hope actually even means and how we can receive it, uh, you know, according to Aquinas and, and according to the course that we're learning from. You don't get hope. Uh, you don't get these virtues. Uh, they are gifts from God. Uh, what do you say mm -hmm. about that? Well, I'll take a swing at it. I know Ryan has wise things to say as well. Good. I see the theological virtues, they're, they're gifts, right? Like the Christmas gift. You have, to, you have to activate them. You have to cooperate with the grace that comes with these gifts. I like to think of them as, as analogies of this life. So the first thing you get is, is faith. You get it through baptism. You get it through by proxy by your parents, and you transfer that faith to your children. So hopefully they they receive the the seed of the word of God, and it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, then the next thing you receive is hope, which is angled toward eternal life. So you have faith for this life, but it's it's already inclining itself to the life to come, and that's the virtue of hope. And the end point, the kind of terminus, which is a, I think a up another pointer to the beatific vision or the life of glory in God's presence forever, which is a mystery so mind-blowing that Scripture actually doesn't say a lot about it. There's a lot more about hell than there is about heaven because it's going to be so good that language falls apart when you try to point toward how good it will be, <laughs> right. and that's charity, a.k.a. love. So in heaven, you won't need faith, and you won't need hope because you'll be loving God with his own love for you. So there'll just be God's love in all forever. And it won't get boring because it's not stuck in time. So to me, hope is like that middle, that middle hinge between faith and love. The first two are more for this world. And then love, of course, is, comes in its fullness in heaven. Well, I'm sure Ryan has yeah, uh, Ryan, an, I, another I uh, train ask, car to add there. Um, so if what Patrick is saying is true, and uh, w from what I understand, 
by reading Aquinas uh, that faith is required mm -hmm. first, and then there's hope. Is there any hope? You know, I know you guys mentioned that this is, um, you know, with a secular spin, you know, maybe trying to reach out to people that don't have faith yet. Uh, is faith required in order to have hope, or could people who don't have faith receive this type of hope? Well, actually, uh, you know, if we go to Aquinas, hope is unique when it comes to the three theological virtues, because as Patrick just laid out for you, all three of them point to heaven, right? But hope is actually the only one that is both temporal and eternal. So, for example, Aquinas would say, uh, and this is why you can have hope apart from faith in a, in a temporal sense. So if there was an atheist listening to this saying, there is no heaven, you guys are crazy. And mind you, even this Catholic on purpose course is not an apologetics course. This, this, is, a, this is a course rooted in truth that, that, that is available to us. So I, I want to add that because it's important. Most folks, especially Catholic answers background for Patrick and myself formerly being on stages years ago, um, talking about this is why you need to come to the faith. I'll let this, I'll let the faith in a sense fight for itself as people come to encounter the truth and, and recognize where that comes from and who created right. it. Okay. It's, this is a, this is more of a CS Lewis approach uh, when it comes to that. It, 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 it's strong enough on its own. Now that said, with regards to hope, temporal and eternal. So Aquinas would say, for example, that a bird, when it creates and when it builds a nest has a hope, an innate hope that that nest is going to serve as the place for its family to grow. For example, if it, if it builds this nest, more will come from building this nest than just simply having a nest in of itself. And, it, and, and so over time, that nest actually becomes something even greater. It becomes the place where it dwells. It becomes the place where the family comes, where it sends its, its, its little birds off, right? Where, uh, where it comes to bring food, all of these different things. So hope can stand alone, even for the non-believer, because we can have hope for something that is good, that is not all the way to heaven. Now that's the ultimate good. That's the eternal good. That's the faith, hope, and charity coming together theologically. And funny enough, Patrick, you said really serves as the hinge. You're teaching the virtues. You understand that what, what the cardinal virtues, the word cardinal actually means hinge, right? It's, it's the virtues that our, our life ultimately hinges on, that, that uh, temperance and prudence and fortitude, et cetera. So with hope, that's the only thing I would really add, is that hope is unique, and it's why we're able to do this. It's why we can be Catholic in philosophy and yet secular in appeal, why we can have conversations uh, as it relates to anxiety and depression and despair for somebody who's a non-believer, because there is hope, If you, and, it, and we believe it is the fuel, right? It, I'll give you a good example, which is kind of cheesy, but for any guy or girl, when we were all growing up, and maybe you had a crush on somebody in high school, right? So, you, so you're a young guy, you got a crush on the on the hot girl at school, and you know she's going to be walking around between third and fourth period or something. You know, this back now, of course, I homeschool and stuff. My poor kids, they're not going to get to live out these movies we saw or that we lived. But that idea of going to bed at night, most people are like, I don't want to go to school tomorrow. I don't, I don't want to take a test tomorrow. I don't want to go to practice tomorrow. I don't want to, whatever that thing might be. But then that little thought comes in your head, yes. But when I'm walking to that class I hate, I'm going to see that girl that I got a crush on. I'm going to bump into her. I'm going to have a chance to talk to her. All of a sudden, that little hope of that brief interaction changes your mindset from I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to practice. I hate this. I hate my life to I, gotta, I can't wait to get through first, second and third period because I can't wait to take that walk from third to fourth period. In a temporal sense, that is what Aquinas is speaking to. It's building that sort of that nest with an expectation that it's going to facilitate something that's a good. So anything related to a good, we can have hope in, whether it's a temporal good or an eternal good. I hope that makes sense. I, I didn't mean to ramble there. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, and that's new to me. So thank you for uh, educating me on that. That's awesome. So uh, Patrick said earlier, the, the tendencies to go from blue pill to red pill to black pill. And we see a lot of black pill, at least, you know, I do in the circles that I run and the men that I speak to, there's this sense of hopelessness. Uh, and it really does follow that, that trend, right? It's like, I didn't know. Now I know. <laughs> oh, no. And so what would you say are, you know, some of the elements of our society that has fostered and bred this hopelessness, uh, particularly in the realm of young men, because that's mm -hmm. who I speak to? Go ahead, go ahead, Patrick. Either, I'd, either. I'd suggest Patrick yeah. here just because I know Patrick has given a lot of thought, especially these past three years with what he's done with Coffin Nation and Truth Over Fear Summit, where a lot of this launched out of Patrick. I think it would be good for you maybe to even explain blue, red, black, and why gold 
matters and maybe how it correlates to this conversation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, it's a book I'm writing uh, called Beyond Red or Blue, The Seven Pills of Life. It just came to me whole cloth one day. Yeah, so the, we get seven pills in life. The first pill is the brown pill. The brown pill is our fallen human nature, and brown's the color of shit, so it seemed appropriate. So you get the brown pill. The next pill is, uh, is dispensed by God himself, and that's the white pill, and that's the grace of purity and sacramental grace in baptism, primarily. So that cleans the brown pill. It, it, it extinguishes the effects of the brown pill. Then the next pill can settle in as a kind of default, and that's the blue pill, and that's worldly thinking, Always trust the government. The media never lies. You know, anyone, any doctor on TV with a white smock is to be trusted. That's blue pill thinking. And then the red pill from the famous movie, The Matrix, where uh, Neo is given a choice, red pill or blue pill. The red pill is the revelation that the blue pill world is a kind of matrix and that you have been lied to, maybe on a massive scale. And so now the red pill it represents all the horses out of the barn that you can't get back. So you can't, you can't not see what you now see. Now, there comes the next pill as a temptation, and that's the black pill. That's basically despair. So uh, life sucks, and there's no answer to it. And so let's let's be like Nietzsche. Let's embrace this darkness. Let's stare at the abyss until it starts to stare back at us. And that leads to a very dark place. It didn't end up so well for Nietzsche. So we don't want to succumb to the temptation of uh, of imbibing the black pill because the black pill is the counterfeit. The real pill that should follow the red pill is the gold pill. That's the sacramental graces of baptism, confession, confirmation, if you're called to it, sacrament of matrimony, holy orders, uh, sacrament of the sick. I think I'm missing one. The Eucharist, of course, the source, the source and summit. So that's, that's, uh, that's the fullness of, of why we exist. But it's e even the gold pill is temporary. So that's the sixth pill. The seventh pill is the God pill. And it has no color because eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it ever entered into the heart of man what God has in store for those who love him. So that's the trajectory from brown all the way to the God pill. So here we are in this red pill moment where you've got a black choice and a gold choice. Mm. And you could say that hope is fuel is pointing to th this is the, this is the exit lane off the black pill because it's only going to lead to a waterfall and the gold pill leads to all the peace, all the solidity, all the transcendent grounding you've ever, you've ever, uh, asked for but didn't know existed. So I like what, when you when you were asking the question about the the black pill. You mentioned young men, and this is something that really resonates with me because I think the manosphere, especially the virtual online manosphere, is a, is a gr kind of a, a caricature extreme reaction to feminism and all of its cancerous tentacles. So we have women going their own way, right? And not just the character of bra burning and women's lib, but the default presupposition that men are stupid. Like if you watch the Kevin Bacon Hyundai commercial, he's like pushed around by his daughter, the whole commercial. It's like, okay, there's a picture of where we are. It's married with children. The, hus the husband, the father's a buffoon. You see this in the Nicolas Cage movie, The Crudes. It's everywhere. It's, it's the, the feminine imperative of feminism. But the other extreme now is in reaction to that, the manosphere with men going their own way, with women being redefined as pickup artist targets. It's really, I think, men trying to grapple with the fact that they, they lose in love. They don't know how to love a woman. They don't know how to self-donate. They've got their own attachment issues. So they, they cluster around this men-only club and kind of grieve without really a practical solution on how to fall in love and marry someone well. You know, it's this, as this, the saying goes, I don't know who said this, but I love it. It's easy to, to love a thousand women, What's hard is to love one woman a thousand ways. <laughs> and I think that's what the manosphere have, hasn't, that's the code they haven't cracked yet. Right. You mentioned Nietzsche before. Um, it's so interesting to see how popular he is uh, with Gen Z. A lot of millennials, you know, they mm -hmm. want to quote him or they'll bring him up. I even met a, a young man at, uh, at, a, at a Christian event with my son, and he said he was a nihilist. And I don't, and then mm -hmm. I asked him, oh, you must be reading Nietzsche. And he's like, who? He has no idea. It's almost like it's become yeah. popular to be black pilled. Um, when did this sort of, uh, I don't want to say virus, but it really is a mind virus seep into Western culture and what are its <laughs> mutations here? How are we experiencing this black pill? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Can I open the aperture and just give a, um, just go back in time Love a little it. bit? Yeah. Uh, the first, uh, this is something I learned from fo- the late father, Frederick Miller. Uh, he was talking about the splinterization of our times. And here's a, here's the a short, shorthand version of it. For the first thousand years of Christian history, you had one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It was the Catholic Church founded by Jesus Christ. Yeah, you had the Copts and you had the Nestorians, but mostly it was unity for a thousand years. And then in 1054, you have this split, the splinterized separation from East and West in the very regrettable, completely stupid, and I hope healable rift between East, Eastern Orthodoxy and the West. So then that's, that's a, a thousand years. Half of a thousand is 500. So fast forward 500 years after that, you have another split. And that's the split between Christ and his church, better known as the Protestant revolt. I do not call it the Reformation because the Catholic faith did not need to be reformed. Catholic behavior needed to be reformed, which it always does, starting with me. Um, But that split between Christ and the church, I think, is satanic. And it's it's a division that actually doesn't exist. Jesus Christ and the church are one thing, as Joan of Arc said to her. Or cardinal uh, judges. That's actually enshrined in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, what she, what she said about the church. Christ and the church are one thing. It's bridegroom and bride. Human marriage of the two-in-one flesh paradigm is rooted in, in the divine bridegroom, Christ Jesus, and us, the bride. So that split at the Protestant Revolt what, had tragic consequences, and it led to the next split, and that's only 250 years after that. This is kind of arbitrary. It's not exactly 250, but it's the compression of the time is, I think, accurate. And that next split was the Enlightenment. Mm. And that involved the split between faith and reason. Instead of seeing them as, as wings of the same bird, right? Uh, fetus at ratio. That dualism idea of splinterization has proved to be disastrous because the default setting among most intellectuals today is that that reason won that, uh, that arm wrestle, that faith has been redefined as feelings or my opinion, but, but reason, so faith has, has been redefined as feelings and reason has been re- redefined as, as solid truth, and, and, aka science. And so after the Enlightenment, now you have all the fallout. You have uh, no-fault divorce, which separates husbands from wives. You have the split between love and life in 1930 when the Anglican bishops at the Lambeth Conference, accepted contraception for the first time in Christian history. And then on and on and on. So now then we can fast forward to uh, to 1973 with Roe v. Wade, where the ultimate diabolical separation between mother and child, on and on and today, to the transgender ideology, which is a split in the very, in the human person, and the confusion to the fundamental building blocks of reality, male and female, even that is now up for grabs because of the spirit of divorce and separation and splinterization. And the answer to all of them is the incarnation, where heaven marries earth and material is brought up into the world of grace through the incarnation. And so as Catholics, we say that matter matters. All the sacraments involve human touch or smell or, or something tangible. Even the Eucharist, right? The, the source and summit of our fate, faith. It's the only example in the world where what we're eating is higher in nature than we are. Everything else we consume, whether it's animal or, or, or vegetable or mineral, is below us in the order of being. But this is God's body. This is the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So this is why it's so central that we receive our Lord. Because he, he doesn't say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have a little bit less life in you, right? No life in you. There's no middle ground. There's, going back to Ryan's story of returning to the church, John 6 is either true or it's, it's diabolical. Either Catholics adore Jesus Christ truly present or we are committing the embarrassing mortal sin of breadolatry. There's, there's no middle ground. So you have a choice to make. Which is it? And that, that we leave up to the Holy Spirit, which is why we don't strong arm. We're not trying to argue. There's not an argumentative spirit here. It's just teaching and stories and, and people are going to find themselves in those stories and they're going to recognize the truth of the teaching or they're not. And our Lord, in, and I'll stop here, in, in John 6, he lets them go. He lets people who were following him leave him because he knows they heard him. And he doesn't call them back and say, oh, let me just, let's renegotiate this. So that's the burden of our freedom. We have to freely choose it. Wow. I love how you played out the, the, the 
the splitting and how the, the time crunch, there was just more and more splitting. That one split, then another split, and now we're completely splintered. And I guess what I hear you saying is that this sense of hopelessness comes from this splitting and splitting and splitting down to where, you know, we're split on the inside as men. We're mm -hmm. split from every sense of reality, both spiritually and physical. And it's interesting that, you know, the the call home through the sacraments, and I, I believe that's what I hear you saying, especially in terms of the gold pill, is a recognition of the unity of spirit and uh and matter pattern and mm -hmm. pattern and matter and it's found in the holy eucharist that's the answer that is christ making himself manifest physically today mm -hmm. for us to receive and to be in communion with him that was profound thank you <laughs> oh thank you yeah another way to put the eucharist is that and sometimes catholics fall into this it's a little it's a verbal error. Technically, it's a heresy, but it's uh, it's understandable. And I do I fall into it myself. <laughs> we talk about Jesus in the Eucharist. Yeah. Jesus isn't in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. He's not. He's not. Hey, I'm here. I'm, please worship me. I'm inside here. <laughs> Rather, it's the other way around. The Eucharist is Jesus. The consecrated host attains the appear. You know, retains the appearance of bread. If you took a consecrated host after a mass and you brought it to the jet propulsion lab, it's going to show bread, 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 bread all the way down. But that's not what it is that's what it appears to be so the, the correct way of saying it is that the eucharist is jesus not symbolizes not represents patrick to, to, to add to this this is this is back in your wheelhouse yeah. catholic answers stuff but you know a lot of folks especially protestant friends you know they can't believe in what is referred to as the transubstantiation what's interesting is right. we don't call it the mm -hmm. transformation the like as patrick just said we don't right. trans the, the the priest doesn't transform the bread into human flesh now have miracles happened like that in history yes you're welcome to research them but it's the substance mm -hmm. of the bread it's yep. sub the word sub underneath what's the underneath what's the grounding what what is the substance of that it is christ it is jesus and so when he says that you would be with yeah. us always go ahead patrick the, the yeah no, the isness. That's it. Is Christ. So, when, and as I listen to Patrick, I I think it's important for for folks to know a, a lot of what he's saying right here, are conversations that do come up in our courses. I mean that that is part of the pitch to that is people don't know where to find this. They've heard about it from some guy. Can we right. trust it? Where do I? I saw it on YouTube. None of the stuff we're doing. Elliot, you gave us an exclusive talk for this for this event too. Everybody that did came with something in mind because we wanted to compile and put this in a single place for folks to be able to to chew and digest and re-eat if they wanted to, because this stuff is that important. To understand what the Enlightenment did to the world and what it did to modernism, what it did to culture, what it's done to beauty. And I don't think what people, and I, I like uh, pictures. Gavin Ashton now also used this. He says, oftentimes when you think about something or you're going to, you know, you're considering something, you'll get almost like a cartoonish sort of picture in your mind of what that might look like. And he had a, quite an experience and, and he discusses that actually in, in, in the talk where he talked about the altar and the altar growing larger in the Catholic church and, and smaller in Anglicanism. Um, for us and for everybody, you know, we all have these choices and coming to, to, to grips with the knowledge of these things is extremely important, but it's also important because when Patrick talks about the splitting that happened and even right now, people talk about feeling what torn, they feel torn about every, oh, I'm torn about this. I'm torn about that. What happens is people are getting uprooted from being grounded. There's very, there's very little grounding in culture anymore. There's very little, there's very few things that ground us uh, any longer. And when you're not grounded, once you're uprooted, it becomes very easy to be torn, right? You can imagine that with the plant, with the tree, with anything. If something is firmly grounded, it's in the ground, you'll see a tree in the woods. It might have got struck by lightning, but the roots are still there. And going back to why we did Catholic on purpose and what that looks like in light of all these questions being asked, the roots are going nowhere. Lightning may strike, right? Trees, there's branches, there's all kinds of things, but there's only one base. There's only one foundation. There's only one root, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's what he's done with his body in, in the Catholic Church. And so as people look for answers, that that is the place that you're going to find answers. 
it is is in the Catholic Church, is in the body of Christ, is in people, is in listen to guys like you, Elliot, and your talk with us, and what it, what it meant in your you know in perseverance and how you tie together what you do uh, in the faith and what Patrick discussed right now. I, I I think it it's so important for this time when we think about hopelessness in general. It's not just that friend who's suicidal; it is them too. But it's all of us. We're all called to heal in this way, which is to offer hope, to keep our eyes on the main thing, on the prize. And, and what hope is, is an opportunity for both eternal glory, but also temporal solutions. This is not just answers to your questions about what year was the enlightenment. There's no tests at the end of this course. What it is, is it's solutions. It's practical mm-hmm. solutions for how people can live out their life in a way that actually makes sense, which helps them in their search for meaning, which also, Elliot, it allows them to educate their family and their friends, not just with their words, but in the life that they're living. So when we have speakers on prayer and mental prayer and different ways to cultivate your, your spiritual life or personal development for somebody who may not even be Catholic, but may, may be listening in, that is going to exponentially impact generations, which is why it's important that guys like Tim Gordon and yourself are talking about masculinity and patriarchy and why Steph is on talking about the role of a woman. And, you know, Jennifer Roback Morris talking about what happened with feminism in the sixties to today. And Rachel Fulton Brown talking about the beauty and glory of devotion to our blessed mother. And always how all these things point to the fullness of faith and life and eternity in Christ. One, one, just a little piggyback on that, Ryan and, and Elliot. Um, Andrew Breitbart famously said that uh, politics was downstream from culture. Religion is downstream, is upstream from culture. Cultus is the Latin word for worship. So your culture is the is the temporal manifestation of of what God you're worshiping. If it's the one true God, you're going to have a very different culture than if it's. Uh, Allah or Buddha, all, all of it flows from what you're worshiping. And if you're worshiping something other than the one true God, if you're devoted to something other than the fullness of truth, that's going to warp your, your everything, your, uh, the way that you cook food, the music that you have, the dance, the fine arts, uh, all the cultural mores, your rules about uh, family life and, and what governs marriage, um, warfare, everything flows down from culture and culture flows from from religion and faith. So we're trying to always go back to the source. Right. The, the Would you say that even someone who doesn't uh, identify with uh, religion, Christianity, Catholicism, is in fact still worshiping something? Yeah, good point. Yeah, the, the St. Augustine has this phrase, capax dei. We all have a capacity for God. We're made to worship something. It's in our, it's in our, our, our building block design. We're made to, to worship something other than us. Depends on, it depends on what, we're, what object we glom onto. For some, they worship their portfolios. They worship their addiction to violent video games, their addiction to porn. Their, it could be sex. It could be power. Um, but ultimately, we're only going to be rested and satisfied when we find our true home, and that's God himself. And Jesus says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we're made to, to be in communion with the eternal. And everything less than the, than the eternal is either going to leave us restless and unsatisfied, or it's going to bind us to itself. And that's something that Father Crow gets into, the fact that we can, we can have attachments to evil spirits and vice versa. And it can be a kind of a subtle realm, uh, the, the fact that we're drawn away. The letter to the Hebrews calls it, it's what, where we get the, the phrase concupiscence, Right. The, the sacred writer refers to the sin which clings so closely. You know, I, I'm a, I go to confession at least once a month and I, I get filled by the Holy Spirit. I'm absolved, filled with the Spirit of God. Great. But I also leak <laughs> because I have a fallen nature and that doesn't get magically taken away just because I'm, a, I'm absolved. It's, it's something I have to keep mountain. I have to keep climbing. You know, can I piggyback a little on that, Elliot? Yeah. Um, to, to somebody... Because I got a lot of friends who who actually respect me and they know the path and the journey that I've taken. I don't typically talk in this way to everybody. You know, I don't see somebody at a restaurant or when I'm out at the gym or walking on the street. And like, hey, by the way, have you considered what the Enlightenment's done to society? Right? Like, that's not the conversation. You must have not have been a good Protestant. Yeah, no, no, no. I was, I was not because I also recognize the funny part was Catholics really understand that Jesus is the one who did all the saving. Our, it's it's our work that that points to the fact 
that in faith we've accepted what he's done. So that that's another reason I had to to we'll call it jump ship back to the to the mothership in that case. Um, but to somebody who's not uh, practicing faith, a yes, as Patrick said, as you alluded to, everybody has a faith in something. Even if that thing is nothing, nothing is still a thing. A, a five year old understands that nothing is a thing. So if you have faith in nothing, you still have faith in a thing. Philosophically, um, it's a. And by the way, it's silly. It's silly to believe in nothing. And for those listening. I don't even need to debate it. It's 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 absolutely silly. You're playing games with yourself. Stop it. Okay? Just be a grown-up. Number number 2. Satan left heaven. I mean just this is simple math. Think about it. Satan left heaven because he thought that you could have a better life apart from God. Simple as that. If you really boil it down, Satan is out of heaven because he thought you could create the best life for yourself without God's help, apart from God. Your choice is either to join the side of Satan or to join the side of God. It really is that. There's no in between. What's that? There is no in between. There's There's no in between. Yeah. I mean, there's black area in life. There's, There's white area in life. There is no gray. There's mystery and that stuff will get worked out. Thanks be to God. But when it comes to making a decision, even if you only believe, here's why I've mentioned that about Satan, even if it was only a myth, right? Before Jordan Peterson started this walk back into faith and what that might look like, or you think of somebody like a Joseph Campbell, um, you know, basing all, all of our existence on myth and learning from myth, even if you base it on a myth, why would you choose the side of evil in the evil myth than the side of good? Well, what does the side of good tell us? It tells us that to live a life, you have to lose your life, to take up your cross daily and die to yourself. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Right? So to somebody who's listening to this, take a look at it. Take a look at your life. Take a look at what's going on. Even if you're not Catholic, yes, the Catholics hold these truths because, heck, we're the ones who put the canon together of the Bible. Protestants also forget that. They, where does it say this in the Bible? Well, it, it doesn't tell us. The Bible was put together to tell us that it had to say that in the Bible. Like, it's just, it's circular. But I can't get, I can't stress this enough because there is good and there is evil. And whether you believe in God or not, that's where we're at now. And so can you be honest enough with yourself? And that's the first step to dying to yourself, right? Is to be honest with yourself. A 12-step guy would recognize that. Admit you got a problem. That's first, like, be honest with yourself. And then move into the next step. And what does it look like to live your life in such a way that there's mutual beneficiality in the end, right? I mean, it doesn't benefit you to go kill everybody because if you wanted to procreate, you needed at least one other person. Like there's just some really stupid stuff. People don't even go to level two or level three thinking, and it doesn't take being a Catholic to figure out things that are very clear in the natural law. We're doing a lot of piggybacking. Can I just do one more piggyback oh, um, off something you just said, Ryan? Um, so as as Protestants benefit from the official pronouncement of the Catholic Church about which books are going to be included in the Bible. You know, if you pick up your Bible, it's got a it's got a table of contents, contents from Genesis to Revelation. 73 books have always been accepted by the Catholic Church as inspired and inerrant. Uh, Protestants actually accept the sacred tradition of the table of contents. They don't even realize it. So as mm. Protestants are the recipients, the beneficiaries of Pope Damas's uh, decision in, in 394, and also the Council of Hippo just before that. Likewise, atheists are the beneficiaries, if they live in the U.S. or right. the Anglo-American uh, establishment, they're the, the beneficiaries of a Christian culture that expects, ex, ex, um, accepts and, and uh, permits their free speech. They can go to Hyde Park. They can you know, start an atheist website. They can bring a bullhorn, whatever. Okay, have at it. L- let's have the marketplace of, of ideas. But... It's a good thought experiment for an atheist. Would you rather be an atheist in the United States of America or Canada or England or a place like that? Or would you rather be a Christian, say, in or even an atheist in Cambodia or China under Mao? All athe- atheist regime, regimes are brutal. It, does, it might work out on paper. It might work out on Reddit. It doesn't work out in the real world because of the culture that, that flows down from nihilism, the nihilism of atheism. 
that's all I wanted to add. It's just I thought about it when Ryan was sharing there. So uh, on the topic of hope, right? And so we find ourselves where we are right now, where there's splitting and there's the black pill. And there are people who will say, you know, this all sounds real great, but what do you guys want to do? Go, go back a thousand years? Um, what does it look like moving forward? Uh, and is moving forward or moving backward in a way? You actually want to go back 2,000 years, right? Yeah, pretty, pretty darn close. Uh, although th that was brutal too. Um, when I read Romans 1, it looked a little bit similar to, to how it looks now uh, in, in certain ways. Um, mm -hmm. Well, C.S. Lewis has a, a pretty famous line in, in which he refers to the, the way we live as uh, chronological snobbery. So most folks that are progressive <laughs> only want to look yeah. one direction. Um, Right. There, the, the the real question about about hope and where do we find it? I mean, we the word nihilism's come up a few times here. That is synonymous with hopelessness. Nihilism. I mean, they are synonymous. Uh, now, with regards to moving back, the the real question is 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 I don't think it's as easy, and I think this is probably our technological culture. Um, this is something, by the way, subjective. So before we get into the objective, I think it's I want to say that part too because we want to speak objective where we can, but this is probably subjective. But I think that our technological culture makes us believe that we can hurry up and have the answer to everything as to what's next and how to fix it. Mm. Um, Google. Google, Google it. The reality is we need to look in all these, like, like we started off with 25 speakers, then 30, then 40. Now we're over 40. We're thinking we may get to 50. Why? Because there are so many different areas that we need to examine the truth and we won't examine them all, but we will examine a good majority of them for those that that want to either understand the Catholic faith or live out the Catholic faith or glean from the Catholic faith, right? So in this case, yes, we can go back a thousand years or we may go back 600 years as it relates to the role of, of men and women. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's as, as it, education is another one. Our good friend Tim Gordon talks about this. Why do kids have an eight-hour school day? And why did public school become, become very popular around the same time that women went to work? Isn't that weird? And who's raising our children right now that are in public school? Like those questions are really important right. questions, but each of them deserves their own truthful answer. So, in, so, the, so to me, the real question isn't how far do we go back and then start there? We have huge problems in our history. America doesn't have all the problems. The problem with America is we think that politics and American freedom is going to solve everything. No, God solves everything. I can have interior freedom without exterior freedom. I may people people actually recognize God's free will through their interior freedom much more than their exterior freedom. We become entitled in those cultures, and we end up in in the mess we're in, which is why hope is fuel is here. So uh, I, I want I know Patrick's I I, can, I know his wheels are turning on this, but I think it's important to note that hope is fuel is really saying to people. Hope is found in being honest with yourself and honest about the truth. What is the real truth about these things? And if, if we're going to live in a world that tells us, hey, dude, you can go be a chick if that's what you feel like, you're lying to them. And the person who thinks that they can do that is lying to themselves. And it's going to be very difficult to find hope if they're not willing to start with truth. Sorry, Patrick, one more little thing, because we're speaking with Elliot, who you know, uh, on the discipline side, on the fitness side, on, on building yourself. Patrick and I were talking a little about this this morning. How many people, Elliot, uh, uh, here's a reverse question. Do you deal with, know what they need to eat? You, you build a, a program for them. This may be in the past or whatever, how they're going to get fit. They have certain goals. They know what it looks like. And they've done it for, let's just say, a week and a half. And they're like, well, I know I'm going to keep up with this. So why can't I just be fully fit right now? Well, because you have to stick with the program. There's discipline. There's part of this process includes you going from benching 135 to 225. And that is six months from now. Stick with the process. Figure out what you need to do today. And that comes back to that temporal and eternal component. There's there's little metaphors that we can find there. And so really, this is this Hope is Fuel movement is about uh, creating an invitation and an ecosystem for folks to be honest with themselves, to discover truth, to see things as they truly are, so they might have hope 
both for now and the future. Because if you're going to lie to yourself, and if you're going to allow culture to continue to lie, and for us to not call it out, we're setting ourselves up for more despair. Mm -hmm. Yep, preach. I like the both and principle as a Catholic. It's both it's both the best of the old and the best of the new. Uh, the wisdom of of the ancients and sacred tradition, but also openness to to new developments. Uh, the Catholic faith didn't grow like a brick building. In you know, in seventy A.D. was story number one, and then in three twenty four there was the second story added. No, it's more like the relationship between an acorn and an oak tree. The acorn doesn't re resemble the oak tree. I think you mentioned this in your in your session, Elliot. Um, we know kind of which which came first, but over time the doctrines of the church develop because historical historical circumstances change. That doesn't mean truth changes. It means it adapts. So people love to say, oh, like Tarantino, I'm going to get all medieval on you. Like medieval is the worst thing. Better to be, you know, better to be a Canadian than a medievalist. Well, the medieval era was really a high point of of civilization. You had the world's greatest art, the world's greatest music, the world's greatest architecture. And, and men came to God because of the order in the universe. But by God's providence, because Logos is always rising, this is God always bringing out good from seemingly intractable evil, now we have a chance to find God because of the disorder on our insides. And so no matter what, what the circumstance, God, the Holy Spirit, has a way of living in us, getting inside us. But all the places of the world, the God of the universe wants to live. It's our hearts. That's his favorite. And he can get there, despite how disordered we feel and despite the lack of order we see in the external world. And so Hope is Fuel as a movement is trying to tap into that, that you don't have to live and there's no perfect ideal time to live. Chesterton talks about the democracy of the dead. Give those who've been thinking about thinking for a long, long time a chance. They have insights for us today because there's nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. That's all I wanted to add. Hope is fuel. Before we wrap up, I'd love if you just reiterated once more, I mean, you did a great job kind of spelling out all the different angles that someone would experience if they uh, join you in this movement and this course, um, bringing together minds, all kinds of amazing minds. What are some of the things that they will experience or, and, and learn and, uh, and glean from this course? No, no, no. Over to you, Ryan. Do you want to summarize some of the topics? Because we'll be here a long yeah, time. Why don't you jump? Everything. Well, think yeah. in terms of my audience, right? So, you know, I'm a 24 yeah. to 36-year-old man, and um, maybe I'm curious about faith, and I have been hopeless up until this moment, and I'm looking for a place to go to fuel this bit of hope that is budding in me. Um, why this course? What will I learn? How will it help me? Go knock it. Yep. I got something, Ryan. Uh, we, ha we have not one, but two mixed martial arts legends presenting. One is a Hall of Famer named Boss Rutten. Boss is talking about the, the fighting techniques as a metaphor for the spiritual battle against evil and against our, our fallen human nature. Uh, Boss just knocked that out of the park. Best practices for even simple things like how to breathe properly. Most people, you know, they, they don't breathe well. They don't, they, don't, they don't breathe the way God made us to breathe to maximize our strength. And that's, that's obviously applicable as a symbol or as a, a metaphor for the strength of our will. And secondly, uh, he's an active MMA fighter from uh, Dublin. His name's Dr. Gavin Carr, K-E-R-R. He's also a seminary professor at the Pontifical University of St. Patrick in Dublin. And he's, he's talking about the fact that you can know God exists independent of Scripture. It's, it's the teaching of Vatican I. It's kind of a funny paradox. It's the teaching of the church that you don't need faith to come to a certain knowledge that God exists. And I think hearing from an MMA guy who's all tatted up is a, is a kind of counterintuitive, it's kind of refreshing thing because it's, uh, it's a unique it's a unique look at it. You don't you see it coming from a, a Tweety professor with a, a, a pipe and a beard, uh, but not a fighter. So, yeah, that's the two things that came to mind for for. Uh, yeah, my, what comes to mind when you now. said twenty four to thirty six? Just you know, being forty two myself, just leaving that realm. Uh, attention spans are short. Which I, now, when you say that, I'm like, man, was I long winded? I'm sure today. So I apologize to those guys in retrospect. That said. Um, 
Memento mori. Remember, you will die. We don't think that when you're 24 to 36. You got your whole life ahead of you. Things are rough right now. I'm going to fix it. I'm just going to make my life right or whatever that looks like. To come to Hope as Fuel is to get kicked in the face, not just by Boss Root and Gavin Kerr about these different things. It's also about these these things that you've that many have likely wondered. Why does why does my buddy have a rosary tattoo? We get into why the Blessed Mother really matters, and it always points to Jesus. If there's interest in Jesus, if there's if you've ever wondered the, the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism and why the Blessed Mother and things of this nature, that things like these that just that pique your interest just enough, right? That that the former chaplain to the Queen of England would come on. I like this kind of stuff. I like to hear these stories. To have Joseph Pierce, a former basically uh, the equivalent of a white nationalist is what we call it in America, but he was in England to come in uh, as a scholar and discuss the 12 books you need to read before you die. And in the process, explain why these books are not scary. And these are all the books, guys, that we used to look over when we were in high school, the Iliad, right? Things of this nature. So I'm looking at it like if I'm 24 to 36, I want to also hear from people that tell you, as Patrick mentioned earlier, how you stay married or how to get married. What does that look like and why? Why is it? What does a real man look like in history? Most folks love to learn real, objectively true history. Why should we act this way? And how do we cultivate ourselves? Just like in, in fitness, you're not doing this in a day. This is a place, and that's why we keep. So these videos, these 45 minute interviews, you can only get them here. They're available for the next 12 months. You may feast on the same one over and over again. And it's not like sitting in a class, this is not a seminar. We're not going to tell you what you need to invest in. There's no insurance people. We purposely did not take sponsors. We have sponsorship offers. We purposely did not so that we could curate something that would make sense to men that are 24 to 36 and women that are 18 to 59 and everything in between. So that's that's what I might add is there is going to be something there that tickles your fancy about the way life is, something that's going to benefit you now, something that's going to benefit you later, and something that's going to scratch that itch that you might have had as it relates to faith or life or culture. And you get good old Uncle E. Uncle E. Get nap. <laughs> you get Yo yeah, Elliot. You get Yo, Yo Elliot. Elliot. So, uh, Ryan, if you'd be willing... Um, Share the details about how we can get involved, you know, the website yeah. and when it launches and how we can get involved. Yeah. So, sorry. The code two, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, that's going to get dropped code. for sure. Um, so you find us hopeisfuel.com. Simple as that. Uh, if you go to hopeisfuel.com forward slash events, that'll take you straight into the page that will discuss this particular event. There's also an archive there because we had a previous event focused actually a more secular event uh, with secular speakers, um, Protestant speakers, Catholic speakers there. And that we may bring that one back out because it benefited a lot of people related to anxiety, depression, and despair. But this particular event, hopeisfuel.com forward slash events, Hope is Fueled Catholic on Purpose, Signature Catholic Course, nearly 50 speakers. Um, at checkout, it is uh, your code. They get $20 off if they use the word strength or the, the coupon strength. Uh, that's it. Look at those things. So I can see them. Holy moly. Yep. So go ahead. Patrick. You want Patrick? All caps. All caps. Yeah, no, all, caps all caps strength. strength. It actually no, won't be it. case sensitive. We'll, we'll make sure that's yeah. the case uh, for this. I don't want to have any hiccups. Uh, God, that, that's so insensitive. Okay, cool. Yeah. But we, we so want to, we want to make sure they get on that. Um, that code will be there. Like I said, the, the, the doors open for this May 24th. Uh, that's when the course becomes available. The doors will close okay. to be able to purchase this by June 1st. Um, simple as that. I mean, it's something you're not going to want to miss. I, we, we have a goal, it's, Patrick, and I don't, I'm not afraid to put it out there. I mean, we have a goal. We want 10,000 people to do this because there's an exponential component to that, right? And if 10,000 people do this, what this is going to do for them, and we're not dumb. We know they're going to share, probably end up sharing a password or a username here and there. So be it, man. God's work. So. It is what it is. Use strength. Get the $20 off. But most of all, get yourself fit mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and of course, physically apart from this. Um, but you'll gain some some nuggets from that as well in our talk with you and talk with boss. And and uh, I couldn't be more excited. I mean, we put this, you mentioned earlier, all the things Patrick's done, a little bit of what I've done as an entrepreneur. My wife knows. I put it all aside, man. This is the call right now. These are These are interesting times. I don't care about the stuff I was after anymore. There was more death to self, death to world that needed to happen. And I'm here because I want to see this happen. I want to see lives changed. I want people to find Jesus in the deepest imaginable way. And I want us all, you know, 
we have a shirt. Our store will reopen. Patrick had one line that was fantastic. It said, your anxiety is lying to you. I had another one growing up when I did at the same time as you, Elliot, uh, with 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 uh, some different hip hop, and so one of our shirts says "Slang and Hope." That's what I want us. I want us to be Slang and Hope um, out there, and <laughs> so that that one will be available. That drops too on May uh, May twenty fourth, maybe before. It's it's I call it next level approach. It you don't want to be all things to all men because I, I would never say, oh, if you're a devout atheist or if you're dealing mascara, it's going to be equally appealing. Probably right. not. <laughs> but if you are someone who's a seeker, if, you, if you're not aware of the proofs for God's existence using your brain alone, if you're someone who's a lapsed Catholic and you're kind of curious about what you're missing, maybe you don't understand the t-shirt that you've eschewed, right, or slung off. Um, if, you're, if you're at that curious level, it'll bring you to the next level. If you are a daily mass goer, there's a whole ocean of, of more to learn. Ryan and I consider ourselves perpetual students of all this. And we're, we're primarily also recipients of hope uh, through conversations like the one that we have with you, Elliot, and the other speakers. We, we're always learning. We, we're, we're not the ones with the answers and our act is totally together. We're on the same journey of going from this level to the next. And this, you know, the Lord loves to be patient with us and wants us to go from crawling to walking to running. Amazing. Hopeisfuel.com. Use the code STRENGTH to get 20% off. <laughs> Or something, something off. Anyway, so at least they know you came from me. Patrick, Ryan, thank you so much, fellas, for taking time out and doing the the works of mercy that you're performing through this project and taking time out to speak with me here on my podcast, brothers. God bless. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. <laughs>